So for this session, we're going to be talking about Newton's law of gravitation. And in order to talk about Newton's law of gravitation, there's a little bit of preamble that we have to do for describing motion, talking a little bit about Newton's laws. So that's what we're gonna be doing first. So in order to describe motion, first we have to talk about what a vector is. A vector is a quantity that has both a magnitude and direction. So for example, when we're talking about the velocity of an object, I not only care about how fast the object is moving, I also care about what direction the object is moving in. So an object moving, say, like this, has a different velocity than an object moving at the same speed in a different direction. We also want to talk about acceleration. Acceleration is how your velocity is changing with time. Now, since velocity is one of these vector quantities and involves direction, this change in velocity could be a change in how fast the object is going, or it could be a change in what direction the object is moving in. Either one of those would count as being a case involving acceleration. So let's look at these three examples. And I want to know which one or which of these cases describes an accelerating object. So pause the video for a second and see if you can identify which one of these objects or which sets of these objects are accelerating. So let's start with this driving up a 30 degree hill at 20 meters per second. So I'm driving up this hill at 30 meters per second. Well, if I'm going at the same speed in the same direction the whole time, well, my speed and direction are the same. So that velocity is not changing. This first case, I would not be accelerating. For an elevator going from zero meters per second to five meters per second, well, there my speed is changing. I'm not moving to begin with. Later on, I'm moving upward. So that would be a case where I would be accelerating. Note that once you're up to whatever the elevator's cruising speed is, once you're up to that cruising speed, then you'd no longer be accelerating. This is part of the reason why if you're riding in an elevator, at the first couple moments when the elevator starts to move, you feel a little bit different. You feel a little bit pressed into the floor. But once the elevator is moving at a constant speed, you no longer feel, you no longer notice that motion as much. Until you get to the top of the motion, when it slows to a stop, your speed is changing again. So you get that little moment of, oh, I feel lighter for a moment. So this one is definitely accelerating. What about this one? A car makes a turn around a wide curve at 10 meters per second. So in this case, even though you're moving at 10 meters per second, the whole time you have the same speed, if I'm going around a curve, my direction is changing. And if your direction is changing, well, that's a part of your velocity. So your velocity would be changing. In this case, it's due to the fact that the direction you're moving in is changing. So a little bit of describing motion there. And also, I want to talk very, very briefly about Newton's laws of motion. So the first law is, if there are no forces acting on the object, or all the forces are balanced, which means we would have no net force, no overall force, then the velocity stays constant. So for example, if I'm just sitting here in my chair, well, gravity is pulling down on me and the chair has to push up on me from, to keep me from just falling through the ground. And right now those two forces are balanced. So I'm not accelerating. Same thing if you imagine a person playing hockey and hits a puck along the ice. Well, along the ice, if there's no friction, that object will keep on going in the same direction at the same speed until it runs into something else, if there's no friction. So both of those cases would be this Newton's first law. If there's no forces acting on it, or if all the forces are balanced, the velocity stays constant. Same speed, same direction. Then we have the second law, which says force equals mass times acceleration. Let's talk about this one very briefly. If I have some kind of unbalanced force pushing on an object, that will cause the object to accelerate. And whatever the direction, let me add this in here, 
whatever the direction of the force is, is the same as the direction of the acceleration. So direction of net force. So the net force, we just mean the total force equals the direction that you accelerate it. And we'll talk about the direction of acceleration. Let's actually talk about the direction of the acceleration now. And we'll talk about a couple of cases, and this is going to be really, really helpful for when we start thinking about things like orbital motion. Suppose that I am walking along the street. So I'm walking along the street. And someone pushes me from behind. So I'm walking in this direction and someone pushes me from behind. So the force is going in the same direction that I'm moving. What's going to happen to my motion? Well, as they're pushing me, I'm going to suddenly start speeding up and starting to fall forward. So in this case, if I have an object where I'm moving in this direction, and there's a force in the same direction, I'm going to speed up. In the case of me walking along the road, I'd speed up as they're pushing me. Eventually, I'd you know fall and there'd be other forces, so I'd come to a stop then. But during that moment when they're pushing me, I'd speed up. What if I'm walking along the road and then someone comes in and pushes me uh, in the chest? Well, if I'm walking forward and someone pushes back on me, then I'm going to slow down. So if we have this case where I'm moving in this direction and the force is acting in the opposite direction of my velocity, I'm going to slow down. Last case, imagine this. Let's say I'm walking in this direction and then someone pushes me from the side. Well, if someone pushes me from the side in that direction, as I'm walking forward, they're going to start to cause me to veer in a new direction. They're going to cause me to turn instead. So if I have an object that is moving in this direction, but the force is perpendicular, that's going to cause me to turn. So in this case, I'm going to turn in the direction of the force. And now that we actually have these three cases, we can kind of mix and match them a bit. Um, we'll see this in a little bit, but if I have, let's say, an object where we have a case that looks something like this. Let's say the force is going this way while I'm moving in this direction. Which combination of these three general cases might this be? So think of what might happen to, am I going to speed up or slow down, and what's going to happen to the path that I'm taking? Well, if I look at this velocity and this force, they're more acting in opposite directions than the same direction. So I'm going to slow down a bit. But we've also got part of the force pushing up, so that's going to cause me to also turn. So I'm going to slow down in this case and start to turn. So we can look at combinations of that. So that's kind of the second law. Whatever force is acting on me is going to cause me to accelerate. Also, the more mass the object has, if I'm applying a force to a very large mass, that's going to make it harder to get that thing to accelerate. It's going to be harder to change the motion of that object. And we'll see some cases of this in just a little bit. Uh, last one, the third law for Newton's laws, if I have two objects pushing on each other, so object one pushes on object two, then object two is going to push back on object one with an equal and opposite force. So a quick demonstration of this one. So let's say I'm on my you know, wheelie chair here. 
If I push that way on the desk, well, when I push that way on the desk, the desk pushes back on me with the same amount of force. Okay? The desk is on the ground. It's not on a wheelie chair, so we can't really see that. Um, the desk moved back as much. But again, my claim here is that when I push on something, it pushes back on me with exactly the same amount of force. And this is a property of all forces between any two objects. So yeah, a little bit of preamble there, but I think some of these ideas are really gonna help us when we talk about a specific type of force, which is what we're focusing on for this session, Newton's concept of gravity. So let me get a fresh section over here. Let's talk about Newtonian gravity. Here's the basic concept of Newtonian gravity. Let's say I have two masses, M1 and M2, and they are a certain distance apart from each other. Their centers are a certain distance apart. There's this thing called the gravitational force, where these two objects that are a certain distance apart, they will experience a force that tries to pull them towards each other. There's going to be a force of gravity pulling on each of these objects. And the strength of this gravitational force follows the following equation. I think I used R for the distance between the centers. I'm going to write this out using D as the distance between the centers of the object. We're using the same kind of idea here. So this force of gravity is equal to this term capital G times mass one times mass two divided by the distance between the objects squared. So let's look at this equation for a minute and consider just two masses that may be attracting each other due to gravity. If I increase the values of those two masses, what's going to happen to the strength of the gravitational force between those two objects? Well, these mass terms, notice they're in the numerator of this fraction. So if I increase those masses, I'm increasing the numerator of this fraction. And if I have a fraction with a larger numerator, the fraction overall gets larger. So if I increase the masses, the force increases. So increased masses, stronger force. Vice versa, if I were to decrease the masses, then there would be a weaker force because I'm making the numerator of that fraction small. What if I increase the distance between the two objects? So if I increase the distance. If I increase the distance, what would that do to the strength of this gravitational force? Well, in that case, I would be making the denominator of the fraction larger. And notice this is distance squared. So if I increase that, then distance squared increases a lot. I'm really increasing the denominator of this fraction. So I'd actually get a significantly weaker force. So again, uh, we can kind of read some of these general properties just kind of straight from the equation. If I increase the masses, well, the strength of gravity is directly going to increase with those masses. If I double one of the masses, force of gravity doubles as well. On the other hand, gravity decreases indirectly with the distance. So it, it decreases with the distance squared. Uh, between the masses. We're going to look at the math for this in some examples in a little bit. Uh, but right now, if I increase the mass, there's a stronger force between them. If I increase the distance between the two objects, well, then it's a weaker force. And this value of capital G 
this is just a constant of nature. As far as we know, it's just a number that has one specific value. Uh, I'm going to list the value here, but we're not really going to use it all that much in most of this course. So this value of capital G, it's called Newton's constant, and it has a value of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, and it has these really weird units of meters cubed over kilograms times seconds squared. This is a very, very small number. And one of the consequences of this is this gravitational force, if I just have like everyday sized objects, like, you know, my mass is around 90 kilograms or so. Um, if I have me standing next to someone else, like, you know, just ordinary sized objects and an ordinary distance away, this gravitational force between us is going to be very, very small. Typically, gravitational forces only become significant if at least one of the masses is a very, very large value. Right, so that's all I'm kind of looking for with this uh, value for Newton's gravitational constant. So let's look at how this comes into play. So if I take an object and I drop it, well, there's that object falls because there's a gravitational force between this object and the entire Earth. The Earth has a lot of mass. Again, the distance between this object and the center of the Earth is pretty big, but Earth has such a large mass that it still has a significant gravitational force. And what happens when I drop this object is that, well, the force is pulling down, so it's gonna start to make this object move in that downwards direction. So as the object falls, well, it's moving downwards and the gravitational force is downwards. So what we get is this kind of a situation. The velocity and the force end up going in the same direction. So as it continues to fall, the object is gonna start moving faster and faster. So as the object, um, is falling, it's gonna speed up over time. The velocity is increasing in the direction of the force. We have this particular case where velocity and force are in the same direction. So it's gonna make the object start to move faster and faster while continuing to go in the same direction. So that describes kind of objects just, you know, moving on or near the surface of the earth. But what if we have an orbit? So let's say we've got an object in a circular orbit. We have, let's say a planet and a satellite. And let's say that satellite has some, a lot of sideways velocity. Okay? Remember, if I just drop this, the object would fall straight down to the ground. But let's say this has a lot of sideways velocity. Well, in this case, we have this situation where the velocity is going to turn in the direction of the force. I've got a velocity going to the right. This force is pointing down. So the path that this object takes is gonna to start to turn in the direction of that force. So if this object is going at just the right speed, then as this thing starts to turn in its path, it's still gonna be going at the right speed so it gets locked into this nearly circular orbit. So this is kind of the case where, again, force and velocity are perpendicular to each other and we get this overall circular orbit. But in the last, when we talked about Kepler's laws, we know that not all orbits are circular. Some of them are going to be elliptical. We talked about Kepler's laws Orbits follow ellipses with the sun at one focus. Planets will move faster when they're closer to, um, when they're at their perihelion position, not their aphelion position. So when they're closer to the sun, they move a lot faster. And we had uh, Kepler's third law. If we have a an elliptical orbit, well, the force of gravity is always gonna pull the satellite directly towards the planet. And let's say it's got some, a little bit of velocity in this direction. Well, for the first part of this motion, 
the velocity and force are kind of in the same-ish direction, but they're not completely in the same direction. So the velocity, the direction that the object is moving in is going to turn a little bit. So it's kind of this combination where when the velocity and the force are pointing in the same general direction, the object is going to speed up. As it moves to this part of the orbit, it's going to speed up. It's still going to be turning, still going to have some of that turning motion, but it's going to be at its fastest point right as it's passing this, um, this perihelion position. However, when it swings past and gets to this point in its orbit, well, now the velocity is going this way, and this force of gravity is always pulling it, is always trying to pull in a direction towards this planet. If velocity is going this way and the force is going in the opposite direction, that's going to cause this thing to start to slow down. And again, there's still some of that turning motion as well. So this set of different kinds of motion that we describe by considering me walking down the road and being pushed by you know, different people and seeing what happens to me, this kind of motion and these properties of motion can be used to describe how planets orbit around stars or satellites orbit around planets, it can be used to still describe these kinds of orbital motions. And just as a little bit of an aside, this was one of the phenomenal findings of Isaac Newton in his Principia. Earlier, there were kind of scientific laws to describe, you know, things like projectile motion on the earth. We had Kepler's laws at the time for describing the motions of planets. But what Newton was able to do was say, wait, these two seemingly different kinds of motions, motions on the earth and the motions of the heavens, basically, they follow the same set of rules. And he was able to identify what those rules are. A lot of time in science, when we have two different ideas, the big breakthroughs come from saying, I've got these two seemingly different things. Oh, they can actually be described using the same kind of higher level set of rules, like electricity and magnetism becomes electromagnetism. Those are very, very closely related concepts, uh, things like that. Okay, so let's look at how this Newtonian gravity relates to some of these other laws. Let's say I switched mass one and mass two. Will anything change with this gravitational force, if I just take mass one, mass two, and switch their positions, like completely flip which one I'm calling mass one and mass two. Oh, if all I'm doing is taking their masses and multiplying them together, it doesn't matter which mass I'm using for mass one and which I'm using for mass two. The forces on both of the objects should be the same. And this is actually a direct result of Newton's third law. If I have mass one pulling on mass two, well, mass two is also going to be pulling back on mass one with the same amount of force. And this can lead to an interesting result. When I say that there's a gravitational force pulling on me, for example, if I try to jump in the air, well, gravity is the force that stops me from jumping up and pulls me back down to the ground. Here's my claim. When I jump in the air and the gravitational force pulls on me, pulls me back down to the ground, my claim is that I pull on the Earth with the exact same force that the Earth pulls on me. This probably seems counterintuitive, but let's consider for a second Newton's second law. I'm saying that when there's a gravitational interaction between myself and the Earth. Those forces are the same. I'm pulling on up on the Earth with the same force that the Earth is pulling down on me with, equal and opposite forces. But what can I say about the Earth's mass compared to my mass? Well, the Earth's mass is freaking gigantic compared to my mass. So if the forces are the same, but the Earth's mass is much, much, much greater, 
that means that the Earth's resulting acceleration is going to have to be much, much, much smaller, imperceptibly small. When I jump in the air, the Earth technically does move a tiny, tiny bit, like less than a fraction of the diameter of an atom or something like that, a tiny, tiny, imperceptible amount. But Newton's second law kind of points us towards where that solution is, that the Earth's mass is so much larger, it's so much harder to get the Earth to accelerate than it takes to get me to accelerate. Those two forces actually are equal to each other. So if one of the objects, if one object is much more massive than the other than the other one, its acceleration and the resulting changes to its motion are going to be much, much smaller. And in our solar system, the sun is far, far more massive than any of the individual planets. We said the sun was about 99.8% of the mass in the solar system. So even though the other planets are also pulling on the sun, the sun is barely moving at all. Despite this, we can actually still detect that the sun actually does move around the solar system's entire center of mass. Primarily, it's Jupiter being the main object that causes the sun to wobble a little bit in its orbit. Um, this is actually another way that we can actually detect planets outside of our solar system by saying, well, the planet is orbiting around a star in some other solar system. Well, if I can't see the planet, maybe I can see a little bit of that tug on the star, and there are sophisticated methods that can be used to actually detect that little bit of a wobble. So if I have two objects in orbit around each other, if they're similar masses, their orbits might look like this. If they're approximately the same mass, then they'll be going through approximately the same amount of motion for each one. You know, the forces between them are equal, so if their masses are also equal, then they're gonna be going through similar uh, similar changes in motion. However, if one of these objects is much more massive than the other one, then that higher mass object, it's harder to accelerate, it's harder to get its motion to change, so it might just have a little bit of a wobble as this lower mass orbit goes through a full motion. Let me see if I can uh, get a simulation. So this is the FET simulation for gravity and orbits. Again, if you want to play around with these simulations, you can go on to Google and just search P-H-E-T and then orbits or something, or, or find their entire catalog of simulations. They have a lot of good stuff on there. Uh, this is the gravity and orbits one. So let me turn on the path and the velocity. So this is simulating the Earth and the moon. This one is the not to scale version. This is the model version, so you can see it a bit better. And if I play this and just put my cursor there, let me let me set my cursor there and then just move my hand away. You might be able to see that there is a little bit of wobbly motion to the Earth. The Earth is significantly more massive than the moon, but we can still see that there is a little bit of a wobble to the Earth's motion as the moon is orbiting around it. On the other hand, if I, and I'm going to have to see if I can set this up a little bit differently. Let's say I made the Earth less massive and the moon more massive, and I think I'll have to decrease the velocity to keep them actually in orbit around each other. This might take one or two tries. Actually, that one's not too bad. So I decreased the mass of the Earth, I increased the mass of the moon, and now notice you can much more easily notice some of that wobbly motion. It is still also kind of like, you know, shifting to the side the entire thing. Like if you centered it on the Earth, it would be doing something like this as the moon orbits the uh as the moon orbits the Earth. But if that difference between the masses isn't as great, I'm going to be able to see the, the motion of both of those objects. Okay. All right. So let's look at this question. So why does a person's weight change from planet to planet? So a person who has a weight of say 180 pounds on the Earth, if they were to go to Mars, their weight would only be around 68 pounds. You know, significantly less. If you're on the moon, I think your weight would only be around 30, 30 something, 30, 30 or 35 pounds, somewhere in that range. So 
why does your weight change from planet to planet? There's a couple definitions in here that we need. We need to first identify what is the difference between weight and mass. When we're talking about mass, we're talking about the amount of matter that makes up an object. So let me write this down. So mass, amount of matter, Uh, in an object. And we're going to measure that in kilograms. Um, this isn't a perfect definition, but I think it'll be good enough for our purposes. And the amount of matter that makes up you, that doesn't change if you go to different locations in the universe. Like if I'm on the Earth, a certain amount of stuff makes up me. If I got in a rocket ship and went way into deep space away from any other, you know, large masses, the same amount of stuff still makes up me. On the other hand, when we talk about weight, weight is the force of gravity that's acting on you. Measured in either pounds or specifically since it's a force, we call the metric units of force uh, newtons. But weight... Is the gravitational force acting on you? It's the gravitational force acting on an object, and that depends on what objects are pulling on you. So it depends on what objects are pulling on you. So when we have an object going from planet to planet, the mass is going to stay the same, but your weight will depend on what planet or moon or celestial object, what object are you actually trying to stand on? So let's say I'm standing normally on the Earth. Well, your weight is just the force of gravity. So if I was to look at this equation for Newtonian gravity. You might want to think, what are the two masses that would be interacting here? So what masses would be interacting in this case? Well, if I'm looking at my weight, it would be the mass of me, I'm one of the masses, and the dominant mass around me that I'm interacting with would be the Earth. So the two masses would be the mass of me and the mass of the Earth. For this distance, well, we actually need the distance between the centers of the objects. So if I'm standing here and I've got, okay, the center of me, I need to know the distance from the center of me to the center of the Earth. Well, even though I'm fairly tall, my height compared to the size of the Earth is negligible. Um, you know, whether I'm on the first or second or third story of a building, Again, compared to the size of the Earth, doesn't really matter all that much as long as you're not at a very, very high altitude. So the distance between my center and the center of the Earth would essentially just be the radius of the Earth. So if we were to put this into the equation for the gravitational force, well, we still have this G value, this, again, just weird number. We've got the mass of the Earth, the mass of me, divided by the radius of the Earth squared, because that's the distance between the center of me and the center of the Earth, if effectively. Now, if you are at a very, very high altitude, let's say I'm a, a thousand kilometers above the ground, you know, that would be well into, you know, outer space. The distance that you'd use would be the radius of the Earth plus your altitude. So if I'm at... Let me draw this on here. If I'm at a certain altitude, then the distance between the center of me and the center of the Earth would be the radius of the Earth plus whatever my altitude is. However, if I go to different planets, 
then, well, the mass of that planet can be different. Also, the radius of that planet can be different. So if you know your mass and you decide, I want to go to a different planet, if you know the mass of that planet and the radius of that planet, you can figure out, well, exactly how strong will the force of gravity be when you're on that other planet. Now, I've got a couple little kind of mini topics that I just want to talk about. Um, not going into too much detail, but just some interesting results from this whole Newtonian gravity idea. Now, in finer detail, if I have like a large object, like the Earth or a planet or a moon or anything like that, every little piece of that mass, every piece of mass of that object is being attracted to and is attracting every other little piece of that mass. So if this was made up of a whole bunch of pieces of mass, I'm just drawing a few, then this object is getting a force on all of those little pieces of mass. This one's pretty close, so it's got a strong gravitational force. This one's kind of further away, oh, so it's got a weaker gravitational force. But all of those forces are pulling all of those objects as close together as possible. Well, when you have a large object, like a planet or a moon, or, or like a larger moon, then what tends to happen is as that planet is forming, as that material is being brought together, since all of those little pieces of mass are attracting every other little piece of mass, they're generally gonna try to get as close together as possible. And this is going to result in an approximately spherical planet. There are other effects, things like since the Earth is rotating on its axis, there is centrifugal forces that cause it to become a little bit of an oblate spheroid. But this is why uh, large masses, stars, planets, large moons, very large asteroids, tend to be fairly spherical in nature. Um, some smaller moons and some smaller uh, uh, some smaller asteroids and comets and things like that, they might not be quite as spherical because as they're forming, well, they don't have quite strong enough gravity to really force it into a spherical shape as kind of solid material is forming. If the forces of gravity aren't quite strong enough, it might allow kind of weirder shapes to start to happen. Um, Again, on Earth, gravity is pretty strong. So even for surface features on the Earth, things like canyons, they have a tendency to, over time, start to erode and kind of flatten out a little bit. Um, but again, smaller objects would not quite have that same ability to make a fairly spherical object. Another thing I want to talk uh, very briefly about is tides. So if we look at the Earth and the Moon interacting with each other, we know that the Earth pulls on the Moon, but the Moon also pulls on the Earth. Now, some parts of the Earth, this isn't to scale, but some parts of the Earth are a little bit closer to the Moon than other parts. And we've seen from the gravitational force that the closer two objects are to each other, the stronger that gravitational force. So the side of the Earth that's closer to the moon is being pulled a little bit more than the side of the Earth that's far away from the moon. And the top and bottom of the Earth, the North and South Poles, they're kind of be put, being pulled on a slightly different direction. So let's see if we draw how these forces relate to how these forces change from what's being pulled on the very center of the Earth we get this differential gravitational force. So what this diagram is showing is, let's say I pick the force from the moon acting on the very center of the earth, that's gonna be my reference point. And these arrows show how the forces on the surface of the earth are a little bit different. This force is a little bit stronger pointed towards the moon. So we get a little bit extra towards the moon. This is a little weaker, so it's not as much towards the moon, so it's effectively 
not as much towards moon, so it's a little bit away. Top and bottom are kind of pulling in and you know down to the sides in different ways. But this differential gravitational force is what causes tidal actions. We get these regions of the Earth where more of the water is going to build up on the front and back of the Earth, and lower tides are going to be at the uh, these parts on the Earth. And as the Earth rotates, we get this, you know, two daily high tides. Let me show a simulation of this to hopefully illustrate the point better. So here we have the Earth. We've got a person on the Earth. Let's see if I can zoom in just a little bit more on this to make this easier to see on the recording. We've got the uh, this rotating Earth. We've got the moon over here. And this line represents the direction that the sun is in. So in this case, the sun is also kind of reinforcing the moon's tides. So we're going to see that that's not always the case. But as this person rotates, they're going to get high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, owing to the fact that the moon is pulling on Earth's oceans in slightly different ways. Notice as the moon starts to move in a different direction, well, those tides are going to generally try to follow the path of the moon. But now it's no longer aligned with the sun, so the tides don't aren't quite as strong as they were before. This is further complicated by the fact that the main thing that's actually causing these tides, let me go back to here, the main thing that's causing these tides aren't the forces here and aren't the forces here. Because water, it's really hard to get water to expand or compress. So it's not that these sides are expanding the water and these sides are compressing the water. The more important part is these parts here, 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 and here. Because those parts, those arrows going along the Earth's surface, that's going to push water in this direction causing more water to accumulate on this side. On this side, those forces push water in this direction, causing less water up here, more water on the sides. Again, that are aligned with the moon. There's a lot of other details that affect exactly how strong these tides are going to be. Specifics detailing um, are going to depend on things like what's the geometry of the coastline, the ocean floor, uh, how the water is having frictional effects with the ocean floor, uh, wind effects. Um, there's a lot of other details that are going to affect exactly how strong tides are at different locations. But this is kind of the, if we said that Earth was, you know, just a complete spherical ocean world, uh, this would kind of identify how those tides would start to change the water levels at different locations on the Earth. Talk about one other concept, uh, free fall. In a free falling elevator, if you were in a free falling elevator and totally unconcerned with your own safety, you might notice before hitting the bottom, you might notice that in a free falling elevator, the floor, yourself, anything else in the elevator, all of those things are falling at the exact same rate. This has well, first, this is a consequence of the fact that if I'm falling, my mass shows up in both the gravitational force equation and my mass would show up in this Newton's second law equation. So that de determines how I'm going to move those two effects. And it turns out that objects of different masses will all fall at the same rate. You can test this out yourself, taking you know two different mass objects, as long as other forces like air resistance aren't as significant, you can drop them and they'll fall at the same rate. So if you're in this free falling elevator, the elevator and you are falling at the same rate. So you feel weightless inside of that falling elevator. You don't have to push on the floor of the elevator to move with the elevator. All of you, everything is moving at exactly the same rate. Okay? This is the weightlessness or microgravity 
experience that astronauts on the International Space Station or in, in various spacecraft, this is that effect. So I actually tried to simulate this. We'll see how well this shows up. In fact, I'm gonna to try to reset my share to share the video a little bit better. So I'm gonna pause this just for a second. So basically what I did was take a plastic container, a clear plastic container, and I put my, uh, this is my uh, cell phone camera stand that I got uh, in there. So it can like freely, you know, move around in different ways. And I tried throwing it in the air and taking some slow motion video. Uh, my camera has a super slow motion version on it. So let's watch that video for just a second. So here's me throwing the uh, container in the air with the slow motion feature. And right here, you can actually see that thing kind of floating inside of the container. This is very, very similar to what astronauts experience inside of the, again, the International Space Station or inside of a spacecraft, where both objects are still most definitely being affected by gravity, but the fact that they're both falling at the same rate will give you this kind of weightless environment. Things seem to be floating inside of the container, but that's because everything is falling at exactly the same rate. So this weightlessness effect, this happens for all or objects that are in orbit around another object. So for example, the moon orbiting around the earth, that's a case of it's just constantly in free fall. Uh, the space shuttle orbiting around the earth or you know, satellites orbiting around the earth, they are just in free fall, but have enough horizontal velocity that they don't fall right down towards the ground. They basically fall in a continual circle around the Earth. In fact, let me just kind of demonstrate this real quick. I'm going to reset this part to be the Earth and the Moon. Let's reset that to the Earth and the Moon. And again, that the Moon is basically constantly falling around the Earth. But since it's got this sideways velocity, it never actually hits the Earth. It's basically constantly falling and missing the Earth. Whereas if I had the exact same starting point, but I said, okay, I'm going to set the velocity to zero, so it doesn't have any velocity to begin with, well, instead of falling around the Earth, it's just going to you know, fall into the Earth in that case. So, in terms of calculations, what are we being expected to do in terms of calculations? This is going to be the first of the comparison style questions that we're looking at. We're not going to do too many examples where we actually have to plug specific numbers into this, including this weird value of G. Um, we're going to generally look at this equation more in terms of how will the gravitational force change if I change some of the masses or the distance between these objects, something like that. So let's carefully go through one of these examples. I'm going to copy this and bring it to the side. So let's copy that and put that in a new section over here so we can write out some details. OK, so this is what one of these comparison questions might look like. Let's say there's a certain gravitational force between the Earth and the Sun. I want to know how would that force change if the planet were five times more massive and three times further away than the Sun is? I want to know by what factor is this gravitational force going to change? Well, a couple of things about this. I haven't told you what the mass of the Earth is, what the mass of the Sun is, what the size of the Earth's orbit is. I haven't given any of that information. And for these comparison questions, you don't actually need it. So how do we set this up? For these comparison style questions, you're going to follow the following procedure. First, you're just going to write out the equation that relates the quantities that you're interested in. So uh, pick equation. that relates um, the quantities we're comparing.
So in this case, we've got a force of gravity is G times M1 times M2 over that distance squared. In the second, second step, we want to make up an original case with any numbers we want. So original case, make up numbers. So what I mean by that is this. Let's say I've got what I'm going to call the original force. Well, we've got this value of g. I'm just going to leave it as g for now. And I've got the mass of the Earth and the mass of the sun. You can pick literally any numbers other than 0 that you want, and you'll still be able to do this question. So we have this gravitational force formula, and we want to just kind of sub in whatever values we want. Generally, when I'm doing these, I like using ones because the calculation is going to be the easiest. So I need the mass of the Earth. So one of these is going to be the mass of the Earth. One of these is going to be the mass of the Sun. And we've got the distance between them. So, well, the mass of the Earth, I'm going to call that one. The mass of the Sun, I'm going to call that one. The distance between the Earth and the Sun, well, I'm just going to call that 1. Because, again, I don't want to make the calculations any more difficult than they have to be. And I'm going to multiply all this out. I'm going to just leave G on its own because, again, that number is kind of ugly looking. So I just get G times 1, or just G. So, again, that's our original case. Then we want to say, well, what would happen in the new case? Because we're saying we're making some changes. We're making the planet five times more massive and three times further away than this, uh, from the sun. And we're still not sure on what's going to happen to this, because if I increase the mass of a planet, that should result in a stronger force. But if I increase the distance, that should result in a weaker force. So at least at this starting point, I don't know which of those two effects is going to win out. I don't know if this is going to be stronger or weaker than the force that we originally started with. But let's see how to finish this off. So in our new case, this is step three, new case, we calculate the changes. So we calculate calculate uh, the changes. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say F nu, well, it's still this, we're still basing this on the same equation. So we've still got that capital G and we want the mass of the planet. Well, we just said I increased the mass of the planet by a factor of five. It's five times larger than what we started with. Well, we arbitrarily said, we're just going to start with one. So if I want to make it five times more massive, then I just use five. If in making up these original numbers, if I would have said, oh, let's make the mass 10. Well, I want the mass in the new case to be five times larger. So I'd use 50. Again, I generally find using just ones for the original case is usually going to be the simplest way to start it. So the mass of the planet went from one to five because it's five times more massive. We didn't do anything to the mass of the sun. So the mass of the sun is just staying the same as one, the same that we started with. The planet's three times further away. So we set the original distance to just be one. We want it three times further away. So let's just make that three. That's gonna be three. And notice we still have to square it because it's the distance squared. So make sure you don't forget that squaring term. That's probably one of the most common typos to make on this kind of question. Well, let's evaluate this. If you do, if you take on your calculator, five divided by three squared. Uh, three squared is nine, so that's five over nine. I got 0.556, let's call that. So G times 
So that's our new case. So again, our steps were step two, the original case, make something up. Again, I like using simple numbers if we can get away with it. In the new case, see what has to change. In this case, I left it in fractions. Generally, we'll write this out in decimals because that's how long capital will accept uh, answers. And the last step, the last comparison part is going to be take the new divided by the original. So new divided by original. So in this case, we're going to say F new over F original. The new case was G times 0.556. The original case was just G times one or just G. And now with this comparison part, notice, oh, there's actually a reason why I didn't bother multiplying out that value of G because it cancels out anyways. That weird, annoying number that we didn't want to really write out. Oh, that just cancels out anyways. So our final result is the new force compared to the original force is 0.556. The way you'd interpret this is my new force is only 0.556 times the original force. It's weaker. It's only about 55.6% as strong as the original force was. We're going to be seeing these kinds of comparison style questions a lot throughout the course. I'm going to be posting some resources, some kind of sample uh, examples of a bunch of different cases where you can use these comparison style examples. But this general approach to the questions, pick the equation that relates the quantities that are being compared. In your original case, make up numbers. In your new case, calculate what the changes are, put in, say, if it if I triple this and cut this in half, put in those factors. And then the fourth one, the last step is, what is your new value divided by your original value? We're going to see them quite a bit throughout the course.